Hey, once again, good morning. Welcome here to uh, Central Baptist. As always, I know a lot of folks just join us on a podcast, also by live streaming. So great to have everyone. Let's take our Bibles and turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. This morning, we're going to start a new series. It's a two-week series here during spring break. And so we'll be in John chapter 1, verse 35. And the title of the series is Love Reaches. And so we'll be looking at the passage here, deals with John the Baptist and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. This past Tuesday, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but this past Tuesday was my birthday. And so uh, Angie threw a little birthday uh, party for me. She made a cake and a uh, homemade cake and did that deal. And we had tacos uh, and stuff. And uh, the grandkids come over. Now, after the grandkids left, I told Angie, I said, we're going to get a sheet of plastic and put it under our kitchen table. From now on, there is more cheese, shredded cheese everywhere than I've ever seen before in my life. But we had such a great time. You, you know, and I know today as a grandpa, and I, you, you know, you kind of know what's going on in my life. And so I got these grandboys now, but they are the best thing ever. And so Angie posted a lot of pictures on her uh, Facebook page. And so this is one of them. So you have Miles and Steele. You got the twins. You, have, you got Liam here. They're all playing in the... In the play box. It's basically a great tub. You got me sitting over here with my birthday hat on, which I forgot I had my hat on, and I wore it the whole time, even when I was outside later. But it was so fun. We went outside in the backyard. Uh, the kids were running, crawling, falling, got dirt all over them. They were probably eating stuff off the ground, but it's okay, you know, whatever. And so just a, a, a good time. And I found myself on Angie's Facebook page through this week, just scrolling through those pictures uh, that she had posted. And I would just smile. Uh, there'd be times I would laugh uh, uh, out loud. Uh, this is a picture that uh, comes from Christmas. We got three of them in here. And uh, hey, by the way, this is not a grandpa toy. This is a grandma Gigi toy uh, right here. And uh, so Angie, our conversation this whole week has been, I said, man, you remember when Steele did this? You remember Miles did that? You remember when Liam did this? And then we were laughing at the birthday party because I kept saying, baby Ray is on the way. You know, I kept bringing that up and Emma kept saying, we're not naming him Ray Ray. I said, well, anyhow. And, and so, you know, it was just a good time. And so our conversation this week has been a lot about our grandkids. In fact, ever since we've had grandkids, we spend a lot of time uh, talking about them. In fact, I'm preaching on a Sunday morning and what is the introduction? My grandkids, okay? Now, here's the kind of thesis of this we'll say. Wherever you gaze is what you praise. Now, let's talk about that a little bit, okay? Wherever you gaze is what you praise. God has given us great gifts, amen? Grandkids is one of them. You know, I got friends that are turkey hunting in other states right now, so hello, by the way, for anybody traveling, you know, that kind of stuff. God has given us hunting. God has given us recreation. He's given us fishing. You know, you know I talk about crappie fishing, the stuff's going on in Mississippi uh, right now and, and all that. I mean, God has given us so many great gifts. So what we have to remember is where we gaze, that is what we praise. Wherever we gaze, that's what we talk about. So in fact, Angie and I have spent a lot of time talking about uh, our grandkids. They bring great joy to us. It's been a lot of fun. We've laughed and, and all that stuff. But also, where we gaze is uh, where we spend our money. You know, Angie told me, she told me this early on before Christmas. She said, I'm going to buy the, the kids a battery-powered John Deere Gator. I looked at her, and I said, well, you realize they can't even reach the pedals yet? She said, I don't care. I'm going to get them one, and they'll be able to reach the pedals by summer. I said, okay. You know, in that. She told me the other day, she said, you know, Easter's coming. I said, yep. My mom and dad are going to come over. Uh, they're, they're still not going to come to church uh, that Sunday, but they're going to come over and, and have lunch with us. They may go to their church uh, early that Sunday morning and show up. And uh, but Angie told me, she said, we're going to get a gift for the kids for Easter. I said, do we get gifts at Easter? Is that how that works? She says, I'm getting something for the yard that they can play on. She told me the second service, she said, you almost told what it was. I said, yeah, I said, look, they're one and two years old, they won't know. She said, but you can't tell. I said, okay. She said, and she told me, she said, we're gonna go get it this week and we're gonna put it in our yard. It's gonna be with their kids. So where we gaze is what we spend our money on. Hey, that's how it works in life. Now, the question is this morning, is your gaze upon the Lord Jesus Christ? Because where you gaze is what you praise. You see, the title of the day is Love Reaches. And basically, if we just break it down very simply, we talk about the lost being found and then those who are found going and finding people. Basically, it's the idea of a relationship with him. To know him 
and to make him known to others. The great commandment of Scripture. So ask the Lord, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord God, heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, upon these two, it's like a coat hanger, hang everything. Upon these two, hang the Ten Commandments. Upon these two, hang the Old Testament. Upon these two, hang the New Testament. Everything hangs on these two. You see, love, it reaches. But the question we have to answer, you know, because where we gaze is where, what we praise. Because what's happened, these boys are very precious to us. They're very precious to us. Is the Lord Jesus Christ as precious to you today as he was on the day that he saved you? You see, I believe what the enemy wants to do in the church today is he wants to get us distracted. He wants to get us discouraged. He wants to cause us to lose the joy of the Lord's salvation. He wants to get us all focused in a lot of good things. You see what the enemy wants to do? He wants Angie and I to put these Boys right here and baby Ray, who's on the way, he wants us to put these on the throne of our heart and put him second. Now, these are precious. They are good, but there's no one as precious as the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's who we've been singing about, singing to, exalting this morning. Hey, would you stand with me for the public reading of Scripture? going to pick up in verse 35, John chapter 1. And again the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked, as Jesus, he looked at Jesus as he walked. He said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. There's just a lot wrapped up in that. That's an invitation there. So they came, and they saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And then one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Let's pray. Father, again, we just say thank you. Thank you for breath in our lungs. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for the beautiful sunshine uh, that's outside. Thank you that we can come together and sing and exalt and worship you in great freedom, Lord, this morning. Thank you for the men and women who have sacrificially gone before us, who have given their their lives for us in fighting wars. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you for those who are serving now for our freedoms around the world. Many of them are watching us, engage with us uh, online. And so, Lord, we just say thank you. And so, Lord, as we look into this passage, Holy Spirit, give us understanding. Give us uh, encouragement. Lord, light the fire fresh and new uh, in us uh, this morning that the enemy would not have his way with discouragement or, or being downhearted or anything like that. But, Lord, that we would look to you, that we would know you. And then, Lord, we'd go find other people and introduce them to you also. So we love you, Jesus. Hey, as always, Lord, save somebody today whether they're engaging online, whether they're here, save somebody today. It's in your name we pray, the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Please be seated if you would. Thanks again for standing for the public reading of Scripture. So we're kind of jumping in here in in John chapter 1, about verse 35. And he starts off in that verse that says, the next day. There's a consecutive two or three days that are going together here, kind of in this passage in the context of it. And he says, he's standing with his disciples, and he looked. He sees Jesus coming, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Well, you really need to kind of go back up in the first part uh, of John. And what we see is John begins to tell the story. He says, There is one coming after me whose sandal that I'm not worthy to to tie or to untie. He said, There's one coming after me. He says, I baptize with water. He said, Man, there's one coming after me. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And then John says this. He says, Kind of, I'm paraphrasing. He says, By the way, He says, the Lord told me. He said, the one you see the Holy Spirit descend upon in the form of a dove, he's the son of God. And John's like, I saw it. I saw it happen. And he says, I know that he is Messiah. He is the son of God. So even a day or so before he says this, and it's back up in verse 29, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Isn't that good? This means yes. Isn't that good? He said, behold. He means when he was, you got to get this picture. Man, he's standing there, and in that area he was baptized, and there by the Jordan, and Jesus came walking around. He said, Behold, look, gaze upon him. Behold the Lamb of God. When he used the Lamb of God here in 29 and then later, that's apocalyptic, if we can say it like that. It's really prophetic in what he's saying. It's, it's looking back, referencing back to Isaiah 53, the suffering servant passage in the Old Testament. It's referencing back to Exodus chapter 12 when the Lord said, The death angel is coming. And he says, he's coming through all of Egypt, and the firstborn is going to die. 
But he told them to take a lamb. And he told them what to do with it, how to pray, but take the blood of a lamb and to smear it uh, over the, the doorpost of the house. He says, and when I see the blood, I will pass over. That's why Jesus being crucified is our Passover lamb. He says, I see the blood, I'll pass over. This is a reference back. I mean, John had his doctrine right. He had his theology right. We know that we see John later when he goes to jail and he's about to get his head cut off there, that there is a, a lack of faith. There is a time when he, he doubts a little bit and he says, hey, get word back to Jesus. Are you the one? Are we to look for someone else? And Jesus sent word back and he said, you tell him what God is doing uh, out here. But at this place here, John, he's right in his theology, his doctrine. He says this. He says, he is, in verse 34, he said, I myself have seen him testify, this is the Son of God. He says, behold, the Lamb of God. You know what we've been doing this morning as we've been singing? I love to sing. Man, I get, off, I get off tune. I sing the wrong words. Uh, I'm singing with my mask on, you know, so I'm muffling or whatever, that kind of stuff. Uh, but we've been pointing to the Lord Jesus. You know, we call that worship evangelism. You know, that's why it's very important as a believer, my opinion, that you sing it. Well, number one, I believe it's important that you sing and worship him because he saved you. Amen? I mean, he forgave you. He died on the cross for your sins and shed his blood. We have an opportunity to, uh, to sing and to, to praise him. But also what we know is there are unbelievers who are here. I was an unbeliever in church services for a number of years. I, I just want you to know, the people when I looked around who, uh, now I was the one there with a the hangover, okay? I wouldn't say. But when I look around at folks, they didn't seem very excited. They didn't seem very happy. I'll just be honest with you. Why would I want what they got? Because they don't look like they got anything. Really? And you know what? There was, there was really no point even in times of worship where that, that I would look around and go, hey, man, these folks got something going on. Worship evangelism, when we sing and, and we exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, do you realize in a setting like this in corporate worship that there are unbelievers sitting around? Hey, and the Bible tells us this, and the book of 1 Corinthians says, hey, they will look and they will know that there is, there is a God that will fall on their face before him and exclaim, God is in this place. We call that Worship evangelism, it takes place. When we're exalting, we're pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what John did. He said, behold, look, the Lamb of God. And he said, who takes away the sins of the world. That's the deal right there. That's the deal. You realize we're sinners, right, who need a Savior? Come on, there's only one right answer. This means yes. We're sinners who need a Savior. His name is Jesus. He is the only one who can save. The Bible tells us that we're, hey, we are born with a sinful nature that all of us have sinned and come short of a glory of God. You know, the Bible tells us there's none righteous. No, not one. The Bible says that if we live his life in rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll spend eternity in a place called hell. Man, but the Lord says he's not slow about his promise. Man, he wants, he wants all people to come to repentance. And I am, when John was standing there on the bank of the river, I mean, all the stuff we see in the New Testament and the verses are wrapped up in this. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, there are two disciples who are hanging out there with John. And John came baptizing with water, and he said, he said, I'm coming this way. If there's one coming after me, okay, he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. I, I've got the baptism of repentance. He was setting the stage as a forerunner. And so when John says that, these disciples hear him. And they, this is, I don't mean this in a bad way, but they were like stalking Jesus after this, okay? They, they are really kind of following him around. You know, Jesus, they turned around like, what are you seeking? What do you need? What do you want? Why are you following me? And they say, Rabbi, which means uh, teacher. It's a term of respect. They said, where are you staying? Which is the idea like, we want to talk with you. We want to know more. And he says, come and see. Okay? A lot wrapped up in there when I say that. Invitation says, come and you will see. Now, let's just kind of walk through that very quickly this morning. He says, what are you seeking? Now, that's a question we got to answer. What are you seeking today? Really? It's in the Bible. I didn't write it. I didn't say it. God said it. What are you seeking? He said, well, I'm just kind of here hanging out. I'm just here, you know. I had one person tell me one time, they said, I'm not coming back to church. I said, why? They said, because you make me feel bad. I'm like, I don't make you feel bad. They said, yeah. They said, I want to go someplace. I come to church. I want to feel good. I said, well, if you'll repent, you will feel good. All right? I said, your problem is not my problem. And you probably think, well, you shouldn't say it as a preacher. What am I supposed to say to them? 
You know, am I supposed to coddle them and go, oh, it's okay. I'm going to try to do better. I'm, try, I'm not going to talk about sin anymore. No, no, no. You know, the job of a preacher is not to make somebody feel good about, hey, man, we get right with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, there's no conviction of sin. We're going to feel good about the things of the Lord and what he's doing. What are you seeking? You know, what are you seeking? Now, let me give a little bit of my personal testimony, okay? I was not saved until the age of 25. I was in church every time the, day, the, the doors were open, and it's because my daddy told me, if your feet are under my table, you're going to be at church on Sunday. And I, I really say, thank you, Harry Jr. Thank you, Harry C. Mason Jr., for having that rule, because you drilled them ahead. You didn't give me a choice. When I was in college, I did not have a choice when I came home from school whether I was going to be at church on Sunday morning. He had that rule. I knew that. It was ground into me. So at the age of 25, I'm sitting on the back row of Wynn Baptist Church in the time of revival, and the reason that I'm there, guess what? I was there for all the wrong reasons. I was there because I had it in my mind. Well, number one, I know I'm grown, and my daddy's not paying my bills, but there's something about I just need to go, and I'm just going to go because in my head, I thought, well, if I go, God's going to be happy with me because I'm here. At least I'm trying to do something right to some degree. And see, I was there for all the wrong reasons. Here's what I know this morning. There are some of you here, you're here for the wrong reason, but I'm so glad you're here. Come on, amen. You say, well, I just came, you know, because I heard you had a good children's uh, ministry. Look, praise the Lord, hallelujah. We want to have the best children's ministry, best student ministry, best college ministry. Our college students usually fill that whole part right here in the 11 o'clock service, and a lot of them in a retreat uh, this weekend and taking their time of spring break and, and, and doing that. And we want to have those things, but the right answer to that question, what are you seeking, is not that, well, I'm seeking a, a great children's ministry. We need to be seeking that relationship with Christ, to know Him, okay, to have that relationship with Him. But if you're here for all the wrong reasons, I'm glad you're here. And if you say, you know what, preacher, I'm coming back Easter. And let me tell you why I'm coming. Because I'm not married, and there's this good-looking girl that I really like, and she's invited me to Easter, and I'm coming to Easter with her. I'm going to wear my mask. I'm going to sit as close to her as she'll let me sit by her at Easter. You know what? You're coming for the wrong reason, but I am so glad you are seeking and coming, even if it's for the wrong reason, because I know what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit can hold your heart. And that's what happened here when the Lord asked him, what are you seeking? They said, Rabbi. Where are you staying? We want to talk with you. Now, what happens here is really a transformation takes place in the life of of Andrew. So after they come out of of that meeting, it really transitions to the next part that, hey, what happens? That Andrew goes out and he finds his brother and he brings his brother uh, to Jesus. And you can read on in the rest of the passage also, but he brings his brother Jesus and we we have kind of the name change uh, that takes place there with Peter. Now, let's just kind of look at that for a minute. You know, Andrew didn't say, hey, I need to go to the membership class first before I start inviting people and bring them. No, it didn't work like that. He said, you know what? I need to get into a, a life group first. I need to be part of a D group. Those are good things. But he didn't say that like that first. He didn't do that. He just, he went out. He entered into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord shared uh, with uh, him there in that room, in that place he was staying, and there was a relationship to develop. And so what he knew was, hey, I need to go find somebody else. I need to go find my brother, and I need to introduce my brother to the Lord Jesus. This is what he did, and that's what the Lord tells us. He says, love the Lord God, heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You see, when we become found and we're found people, we go find other people. That's just the way it works. We know him and then we make him known. And so we see Andrew going and doing this. You know, when uh, I went to work in Wynn, Arkansas, uh, Angie and I had been married, I think about a year. We moved to Wynn. And so I went to work at the farmer's co-op and there was a, a, a guy at the farmer's co-op. He was about six foot two. His name was David. And uh, I worked in outside the office. I had a little truck. That's when we had the old tire phones that first came out. We had those. And so I'd be out scouting and doing that kind of stuff. And, but this guy, David, he asked me, I think, every day, he'd say, well, you come to Sunday school next Sunday with me. And, uh, I mean, he, he would wear me out. There'd be times I would come in from the field, and I would drive up to the co-op, and I would not want to go into the co-op because I knew he was going to be in there, and he was going to ask me about Sunday school. He didn't ask me about coming to church. He asked me about coming to a Sunday school class. And I want you to know, I was a grown man. I think he, like, emotionally beat me down in the name of Jesus, if you can say that. He was like, because Andrew, when you read on, 
in the Gospel of John. He's the guy, you know the story of the loaves and fishes? He says, hey, here's this lad. Well, who found him? Andrew. When you get to John chapter 12, and it talks about the Greeks were coming, Gentiles. They wanted to see Jesus, but they were asking for Andrew, so he would take them to Jesus. I mean, he was not correct, uh, not correct grammar-wise, but he was a bringer, okay? He brought people to Christ. Uh, he did that. Well, this guy named David, I mean, he wore me out, and all I can tell you is the rest is history, man. The rest is history. You know, and I've shared this before, and this is what don't do if you have a life group, you know? So the door opens up to the life group. I have been beat down emotionally all summer long about coming to church. I mean, it took a while with me. And uh, they beat me down emotionally. He was inviting me to come, you know. And the door swings open. All the women were sitting in the front of the class and all the men were sitting in the back. And Angie grabbed my hand with the death grip like this. And the guy in the back said, hey, all the men sat in the back. If you're in a life group, don't ever do that to a person's first time when they come through the door. Okay, you agree. All the men sat in the back. Angie grabbed my hand. She looked at me and she went, I said, yes, ma'am. And so I sat on the front. Okay, I'll just share that with you. Anyhow, hey, it took, okay, I got saved later, age 25, all right. And so here we are today. But he was that type of person. Now, the fun is in finding people. You know, there are times I have to tell David. I almost sent him a text last week. I was thinking through that in my mind as I was preparing. And I need to do it. I just need to send him a text and say, thank you. Thank you. You didn't give up. You wore me out and laughed at it and smiled about it the whole time. You see, he was an inviter. He was a bringer. You know, he probably, if he could have set me down, I remember we was on a plane one time going somewhere, goose hunts, what we were doing. And I remember he, he could have set me down and said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what he was doing. He was pointing me to Christ. He was bringing me to Christ. He was very instrumental in getting me at Win Baptist and getting me on the back row during that revival, that church service. You see, Andrew cared about those who were lost and needed to be found. Uh, I brought my duck calls with me this morning. And uh, I know some of you are not duck hunters and that kind of stuff, but I'm gonna put these over my head. And I'll tell you a little bit about them. We're gonna close out. These are uh, rich in tone calls. These are acrylic calls, okay? I know this doesn't mean much to you, but do to me. You say, you look like a gunslinger or something with two of them. Okay, hey, I can do this and keep a dog at the same time, but one of them is real loud. You can hunt a rice field. One of them is real soft. You can hunt the timber with it, and I love these things, okay? So I'm from Prairie County. These are Arkansas County Stuttgart-made calls, all right? This is a speck call, okay, because we like, we call it specks of ribeyes in the sky. I know that doesn't mean something to you, but anyhow. And then all this stuff right here, these are bands. Now, I got friends that got bands all the way around their neck. My brother-in-law, I think he's got two big lanyards. I mean, for, for all the ladies, when you talk about bling, we know what y'all talking about. When men talk about bling, we're talking about this stuff right here, okay? I mean, this is it. And, and the thing about, there's a green band on here. That's a $100 band. The federal government bans ducks and puts money bands on them. And uh, so that's right, you know. And uh, what you do when you duck hunt, whenever you shoot, you claim whatever falls because it may have a band on it. This way it works, okay? And uh, that's a $100 band. I shot that duck 32 years ago. He was a double banded duck. In fact, I got a picture. I, I'm not going to throw it up on the screen. I look like I'm 12 years old. Angie and I are married, by the way. I look like I'm 12. Double banded duck. I got another band on here that's a wood duck band. I can almost tell you the tree at the Black Swamp I was standing by when I shot it. I've hunted the White River. I've hunted Hurricane. I got the Langill River. I got bands from everywhere. This thing right here is precious to me. It may not mean nothing to you, okay? But it is precious to me. Well, when Angie and I moved, we boxed everything up. And in fact, we've been in the house here in town for so long that we had stuff from our kids who had already gotten out and got married that we were still storing for some reason. I don't know how that works. Anyway, we boxed our stuff up and just moved it with us. And so I boxed up a lot of stuff and I made sure, at least I thought I did, that I knew where these were because it was the summer when I did that. But when we got to where uh, we were living, these were nowhere to be found. Now, I just want to be, I'll tell you this, because there's some guys in here who have asked me in the past couple of years to go duck hunting with them. And I mean, in fact, the duck hunting hadn't been real good on this side of the state. But there have been many times I've turned people down duck hunting. And uh, the reason was, I'd say, well, I got to work. I got stuff going on, which I'm not lying, okay? But really, the main reason is I did not have these. You see, for a duck hunter, a duck hunter to go duck hunting without this, it's like going duck hunting without your waders, 
He just don't do it. It's like if you got a great duck dog. I mean, when I had Bo, my duck dog, if Bo couldn't go, I didn't go. It's just the way it was. You know, people say, I got a dog. I'm like, you ain't got a dog like mine. You know, and I'm, I'm fat and I don't want to walk. That's what I'd say. You know, I'm going to send him after him and do that. Well, Angie, Angie would tell me, she'd say, you need to go duck up with him. I said, I ain't going because I ain't got my call. She says, she says, well, you don't have to have your calls. I said, them boys can't call like me. I'm taking my calls or I'm not going. I'm going to tell you. So I fretted. There have been times I think I absolutely, I believe I shed some tears. I couldn't find it. I've dug through boxes. I've dug through waders. I've dug through hunting coats. I've dug through stuff two and three times. Or Angie and I, this was a Saturday. And so we were going through some boxes that I've been through before. And it was a gray tub. And she brings it to my office. I was out in my little shop. And she brings it up and she says, you need to look at this. I said, I've been through that tub. She says, well, maybe your duck calls are in there. I said, they're not in that tub. I said, I've been through that tub. She says, well, you need to look again. I'm like, okay, you know, attitude. And I take the top off. I'm digging through there. And I'm like, they're not in here, you know, and uh, put the top back on. And I might have been preparing to preach. It was, I think it's Saturday afternoon. And uh, I was sitting there thinking, I thought, well, maybe I just haven't looked good enough. I, I promise you, I've looked five times in that tub. And so I, I picked that tub up a little bit and shake it. And I heard this. Sound like Christmas or something, you know? And I heard that. I tore that lid off. I look like the kids in the play box, you know? I'm digging around. Hey, and it's like angels started singing. I pulled this thing out. Ooh! And I shouted. I said, Angie! I hollered at her. And at the same time, I was like, thank you, Jesus. It's a supernatural miracle. They have appeared supernaturally. You know, Angie came in and I said, look. And she said, I told you so. I told you they were in there. I'm like, they were not in there. Jesus made them magically appear. She's like, no, they've been in there the whole time. We go back and forth. I put those calls down. I said, come here. She's looking at me like this. I said, come here. She walks over here like this. I grab her by the arms. I looked at her and said, I'm about to kiss you right in the mouth, baby. <laughs> hey, I laid one on her. I wrapped my arms around her. Do you remember? And she was standing there like this, you know, like, what are you doing? Well, why did I go crazy? These things are very precious to me. Now, please, Lord, don't let me lose them ever again, okay? <laughs> so, uh, they're very precious to me. Now, here's how we're going to close. Are the souls of men and women, girls and boys, as precious to you and me as a set of plastic calls? and a little bit of metal that's been put on animals flying through the air? Do we weep over lost people? What about your family members? Are their souls as precious to you as something like this? You see, Andrew, he got it. The fun is in finding people. You see, the Lord is doing a work the Lord is drawing people to himself. And the fun <laughs> is when you get to bring them to Jesus. You know, I know some of you are discouraged. I know some of you are downhearted. You know what? Just go out and find someone today, family member, friend, and say basically this, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, what you do is you point people to Jesus. And you see what found people do is we find people. The church a lot of times gets off mission. Are we going to fight liberalism? Well, we're going to stand up for the unborn. But number one, we're going to preach the gospel of Jesus. That's what our purpose and our mission is, is to preach the gospel. Our purpose and our mission is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and lift him up and lead people to a relationship with him. You know, our invitation this morning, number one, for those who are believers here, again, I, I know I've been beating this drum during the pandemic, but I believe the enemy has maybe sown seeds of discouragement into your life. Maybe it's been the seeds of depression and those things, the seeds of fear. We talked about that last week. And to where he's, he's, the enemy's tried to move Jesus off the throne of your heart and put something else. And it may be today you just need to pray that Psalm 51 and say, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. I know I say it every Sunday, but I believe that's where some are today. There's some believers here today that you need the Lord to renew you and refresh you 
and to encourage you to get your eyes off all this junk that's going on and put your eyes on him and on lost people. Put your eyes on him. You rejoice in him. You know he has a home for you in heaven. He's forgiven you of your sin. He shed his blood on the cross for you. And then you put your eyes on finding people and bringing them to him. That's where the fun is right there. So that's number one. Number two, it could be this morning you don't have a burden for lost people. When's the last time? And we got to ask myself this question. Angie has to ask herself that question. When's the last time you wept? When's the last time you searched frantically in every crevice, every box, every place for someone who does not know Jesus? Maybe today is the time in our invitation we just say, Lord, restore to me a burden for those who are lost. And it could be, Lord, will you just make a commitment and say, Lord, I'm just going to pray for Uncle Joe. I'm going to pray for Aunt Sarah. I'm going to pray for my brother. I'm going to pray for my sons and daughters. And maybe sons and daughters, it's God's move on you today to pray for your parents. I remember preaching a sermon on a wayward children. A young person came up and asked me, said, what about wayward parents? I said, never thought about that. So could it be today that you just ask the Lord to restore to you that burden? for those who are lost. Maybe the Lord's put someone on your heart. Hey, bring them Easter. I don't care if they come for the wrong reasons. Hey, you just invite them. Let the Lord move and work. The Lord straighten all that stuff out. And maybe it could be you just pray for that person. Maybe it's that hard knot we talk about that they seem calloused or whatever. Look, I was hard. I was calloused. And an old boy at the co-op never gave up. Don't invite me to come. It worked. It worked. Now here, most importantly, I know that here, I know watching, engaging, you're not born again. You know, you say, well, I came seeking Jesus when I was 10. I just want an insurance policy. That's not the right answer. Well, you know, I just come to church because I'm, I'm just trying to be good. That's not the right answer. It doesn't work that way. You'll never be good enough. Jesus said in Matthew, he said, come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Some of you are weary. Hey, I'll give you a testimony. You're not going to find it in the things of the world. There's no peace. There's no joy. It's only temporary. Don't make any money difference how much money you make. It's only found in him. He says, come unto me, weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Come to him. Come to him in faith. Come to him in repentance. Lord Jesus, you're right and I'm wrong. Lord Jesus, you're the Savior. I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, I repent. I turn away from my sin. Lord Jesus, save me. Oh, my dear friend. Oh, my dear friend. Luke chapter 15 tells the parables of those that are lost and found. And it says, the angels rejoice over one sinner who comes in repentance. That's the word of God. So surrender everything to him today. Put your eyes on him. Put your faith in him. Come repentance. He'll save you today. Would you bow your heads with me? There are some. Be restored. Be renewed the joy of his salvation to you there are some you don't have that burden for those who are lost you know man just ask the Lord Lord cause me to weep over people pray for them there are others who are lost but today's a day to be found surrender to him right now in faith and repentance he'll save you there's going to be pastors here deacons here the altar's going to be open Father we pray in the name of Jesus as we always say because there's nobody else but you And so, Lord, we say thank you. Lord, have your way in this time of invitation. Stir and move. Renew us. Refresh us. Let us be the light upon a hill. Let us know that we are sent people. Let us find our joy in you, our love for you, and our love for others. In your name we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand, please.